the Small Town Podcast, a series of podcasts aimed to help propel and stimulate the professional uh, careers of artists and arts workers on PEI. This is our last episode, and it's live here at Upstreet, who is a wonderful and beautiful sponsor uh, and supporter of many arts initiatives, including lots of activity from This Town is Small. I also want to give a shout out to Innovation PEI and the PEI government for funding this project. Uh, without them, this would not have happened. And I, the other episodes have been hosted by Sarah Roach Lewis, who is wonderful. And I'm Becca Vio, and I have in one of the podcasts, but I also helped to produce the work. And uh, it's it's been a journey. We, we, did, we started off with one-on-one -on -one mentoring with people, and through my conversations, it came to the point where it was like, actually, the only way to reach people, because we're so gosh darn busy, is to have a podcast that people can listen to on their own time. And so that's what we moved into. And so from today onward, for nine weeks, there'll be a podcast released every Thursday to listen to and they span from self-care stress management to like volunteer engagement how to write a arts proposal how to be super cool in charlottetown you know all the good things right that are important <laughs> Um, I also want to I also just want to say that this town of small has some great funding for people with uh, going on residencies off island um, if you are an artist and you're traveling for a residency you can apply to this town of small for up to a thousand dollars travel grant and that's an ongoing rolling uh, deadline and it's highly recommended uh, to just start looking at residencies even if they're close or what might potentially be like, you know, your perfect creative retreat. Just saying. Um, so that happens, and you can find more information on thistownismall.com, and that's where the, the podcasts are also held, is thistownismall.com. So I'm just going to start by introducing our panelists for our panel today, which is titled, Artists Need Money. <laughs> How, what, and why. That's the title of the podcast. And uh, we have Ren Renee LaPrise, Rob Oakey, uh, Pan Went, and Shannon Pratt all here around the table. Uh, Renee LaPrise wears many hats, including professional editor, creative producer, and artist. And for the past five years, Renee has been the executive director of Film PEI, formerly Island Media Arts Cooperative, an organization that has rebranded and tripled its base and equipment inventory in the last year. In this position, Renee works to develop the film industry and facilitate the creative careers of PEI filmmakers and artists. Her web series, Lovely, Lovely Witches Club, was one of the first web series funded by the Telefilm Micro Budget Pro Production Program, sorry, known as a talent known as a talent to watch. And in the coming years, Renee's goals outstanding of grow, outside of growing the PI film industry is to continue to develop content, film and visual art that explores her indigenous heritage. So welcome, Renee. Yay, Renee. Uh, Rob Oki is currently the executive director and co-founder of Music PI. Rob Oki has been instrumental in the current growth of PI's music industry since helping to establish the organization in 2008. Number of PI uh, since 2008, the number of PI exporting and internationally touring artists has grown by over 400%, which is incredible. Prior to heading up Music PI, Rob has had spent 10 years developing exports of PI's building material sector. I had no idea. Internationally in nine countries and marketing and marketing Anna Green Gables homes in Japan. This is amazing. Rob used that export development experience to help establish PI as a major as a major Canadian exporter of music. He sure has. Under Rob's guidance, Music PI has developed an effective grant program for the music industry, distributing close to 100,000 per year helping to leverage private sector investment of close to three times that amount, along with numerous other development programs. Rob has been the executive 
producer of Music PI Week since 2006, overseeing the creative and logistics of an annual event presenting showcases, concerts, and an awards program. Music PI is, has also created two internationally recognized conferences, Showcase PI and the Canadian Song Conference, as well as artist exchange programs with the England, with, with in England, Denmark, and Wales. And since 2014, Rob has produced the classic music reignited series at the Watermark Theatre. That's cool. And is also a mandola, man, man, mandolinist? Very good. Mandolinist, when time allows. And he's a good one. Uh, we also have Pan Went, who's a close friend uh, and I adore him. Uh, Pan Went is the curator at the Confederation Centre Art Gallery in Charlottetown, and he's been there since 2010. And he's also been the co-curator and I would say one of the co-founders of Art in the Open since its inception in 2011. Aside from his curatorial practice, he's a critic, writer, art historian, and event producer. He's currently teaching art history at UPEI. He was trained as an art historian, art historian at Williams College. He has a bachelor's and a master's there and Yale University with a master's and a master's in philosophy. Is that what that means? MPhil? Yeah. Wow, you have so much education. It means I didn't finish my dissertation. Oh. Well, you have lots of education. You're so so educated. He has published widely and has served on numerous national juries, including Soviet Art Award, RBC National Painting Competition, and Canada Council of the Arts. Notable ex exhibition projects include Funk Aesthetics, Hank Bull Connection, James Lee Byers, Letters from the World's Most Famous Unknown Artist, and Who's Your Mother, and Colleen Wollstenholme, A Divided Room. Thanks, Pan, for coming. And last but not least, we have Shannon Pratt, and she's here representing the province of PI and Innovation PI. So Shannon Pratt is the Creative Industries Development Officer from the province, working in the Cultural Development Division of Innovation PI. She has written and reviewed more than her fair share of funding applications in the 12 years since she returned to the island as, and has secured over 100,000 in grants for organizations, artists, and small businesses. Before moving home, Shannon worked in the film and television industry as an assistant director in Vancouver, BC, on a number of shows, including Smallville, Underworld 2, what? And Shooter. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's what? a tr yeah. true story. <laughs> yeah. Great. So maybe like how we could start would be we can just, whoever would like to start first, maybe if you can just answer that question a little bit or start to answer the question artists need money. How, why, how, why, and what? Or why, what, and how? What, how, and why? <laughs> All those things. Or any of that or order. Any, any of those orders. We just need to know how, how artists can get money and why, why is it important. So I'll let anybody just start. I'll start. Great. Um, first of all, we have to realize how fortunate we are in Canada. We're the envy of many countries around the world. We get more support for arts and culture here than... I mean, uh, you, you talk to artists from the U.S. and they are so envious of what we have. We've got funding on a lot of different levels. Um, just, you know, here alone we've got Music PEI for, uh, for music, we've got the Provincial Arts Grants, we've got Canada Council, we've got, you know, things like Factor, Canadian Heritage. I mean, the, the list is pretty extensive. So, as difficult as it is um, to keep a career going, we're a lot better off than a lot of places. And um, I think, you know, we, we need to realize that. Um, but, you know, in terms of, of uh, sustaining a career as an artist, it's, as we all know around the table, it's one of the most difficult careers, whether it's, it's music or visual arts or dance or theater, or whatever. Uh, it's really, really hard. Um, and I often tell, uh, young artists that come into our office that if you want to enter the music industry you're about to enter the most one of the most competitive industries in the world in, in anything because there are so many artists out there and access to uh, the market is so much easier now with the you know the, the digital internet. age the internet the internet <laughs> the yes. internet's broke it all um, <laughs> So it, it's just so competitive that trying to develop a sustainable career uh, without the kind of support that we get, the, the funding support and government support, uh, is just almost impossible. 
That's my first bit. Great. Would anybody like to respond? <laughs> Would anybody like to respond? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it is difficult to maintain uh, an arts career and make that your focus, but um, I think you can work within, especially in film, you can work in the commercial side of film and keep your keep your uh, t your uh, skill set up while you're developing your own content. It's not super easy, but you can do it. <laughs> yeah, I think you see there's a lot of hybrid careers that take place in order to be able to maintain a career as an artist. So like you'll have musicians who might be, you know, trying to tour as pop musicians, whatever, but they're also writing music to be placed specifically in film and television. So they're getting those alternative revenue streams. And like you were saying with film, you have people who work in commercial projects, but then they're also shooting their indie films as well as you're doing your passion project, but you're also doing the thing that pays the bills so that you can keep doing the passion project. And then we all get really, really tired. Yeah, then we get tired. But, you know. but you keep doing it. <laughs> the art feeds you. It does. So when you're actually doing your art, you don't, it kind of re, refills up your tank again. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's why you have to always go back to your passion, do it for a while, and then, and then go back into make money to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Becca, were you wanting people to give a short presentation or, yeah, you just, can, or just keep moving? You can keep going. You can say what you need to say. Well, I, um, my, I guess just in response to what's been talked about so far, I would say the first thing to know if you're going to enter into any artistic career is that it's an extremely exploitative industry. So you, there is a great encouragement for people to work for free and to, to uh, you know, ultimately uh, often to sort of wash very questionable things. Uh, and you will be asked again and again to, do, to, to work for nothing or for free as a way of promoting your career often. Um, and, you know, let's face it, art is, is basically something that we pursue for, according to... Um, a kind of desire to live a fulfilling life. That's fundamentally why we're drawn to it. Is that, and therefore we are great. Anybody working in this field is is a target for exploitation. Just as most worthwhile activities and jobs that don't involve screwing people uh, or stealing their money or whatever are actually low paid. Art is probably the ultimate example of that. So, you know, if you want to make a lot of money you should concentrate on making money. And art is probably the wrong area to be in. That said, there is a high ceiling uh, for some people. Um, but considering, I think of my own career, uh, considering the amount of training and student loans and so forth that I put into my own career, I probably, uh, you know, I mean, the economic reward is kind of laughable. So. Make, it's, I think it's very important to know what you're getting into and not, there is a lot within the ecosystem of the arts that tries to hold out a carrot to you that if you do this free stuff, you know, you're going to promote yourself and it might lead to something. And I think a lot of people, are, a lot of people who should be doing something else actually because this is, it, uh, are being suckered into, uh, you know, exploitative things and providing content and providing culture and so forth um, that's you know that people actually want but aren't willing to pay for so that it's would be the most the negative <laughs> it's interesting that the you warning. know you wouldn't ask someone to build you a house for free exactly. so that they could promote their business yeah. could you? you imagine though seriously hi build me a house and you can put a sign out front and I'll tell my friends yeah Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, that just doesn't happen in other other careers, you know. But you're right; the arts is very exploited. I think we all we can all speak from direct experience of that. Um, so, uh, as you know. um, some people here are community funders, so Rob with a, with Music PEI and uh, Renee with the Film PEI, like you. You, both of your organizations are providing funding at this moment. Can you talk a little bit about the 
diversity of where that funding comes in from and how it then comes back out. So like, are you, <laughs> yeah. So like, where does it come, where does your money come into the organization for artists? Like who is funding artists rather than funding organizing or funding, you know, non super creative stuff, right? Like the exploitative stuff, right? I don't, I don't really understand the question. Well, okay. I think I do. Yeah. Okay, Let great. me just see if I can frame it. Um, our funding that we provide to our members, our artists, comes directly from the province. And that is the only money we use for our grant program. Um, we can't get funding from, say, Canada Council or Canadian Heritage to put into our funding program. The province is the only contributor. So it's, it's limited what the province can do. Um, if Factor would give us you know, another 100000 that we could give out in grants, that would be great. But that just doesn't happen. So, and I think you might be in the same position. Do you yes. get... So the grants that you actually give out to, to your... Uh, community all comes from the province. Well, honestly, this is the first year. This is Renee talking about <laughs> Film PEI. But uh, this is the first year for grants through Film PEI. And yes, we get it through uh, innovation. Um, we have given out small micro grants before that actually come that we because we rent equipment we do have income some income so if we see that there's money in there we can do like little bursaries and micro grants we also give we also have equipment for rent so we may not be able to give cash but we do give uh, we do have substantial resources to be able to alleviate the cash need for our artists. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a grant in a way. And yeah. so do you feel that the national scene is just not funding creation? They're, right now, they're funding, so they fund directly um, to the artists. So yeah, they Canada, fund right to the Canada artists. Council, yeah. for example, provides funding directly to artists. They don't... I don't, I don't know if there's any situation where they, and Mark, you might know this, where they fund an organization who in turn turns that into a grant program. I've never seen it. No, yeah. no. But you, like, I mean, Film, P, Film PEI is funded by Canada Council, and we can apply for uh, programs, residencies that will bring, that will allow artists, that we can pay artists to make work. Um, but, you know, you, it's project by project based on... Uh, you know, I we have one an indigenous project right now that's uh, it's for ten week or ten months, and um, it's to help uh, youth make content, but they won't get cash. But it's they'll get the benefit of that, you know. But funding artists directly, you, they have to apply to Canada Council for that. Yeah. Or factor in the case of music. Um, Radio Star Maker. Radio Star Maker, yeah. SoCan Foundation. Uh, what about in the visual arts? Uh, uh, Canada Council? What is there aside from Canada Council? There's Canada Council, there's artist grants uh, nationally and uh, provincially, but all, also built in is, is um, artist fees for exhibition. So, I mean, certain kinds of artists uh, will a big part of their income will actually be things like artist fees through exhibition and also commissions from public institutions. That's just being paid, though. That's being paid. That's, being paid. <laughs> yeah, that's, being paid. that's, that's a little different than paid. a grant. Yeah, You're right. I mean, yeah. it's, it does happen that, for example, we will give artists money to produce work, but it isn't that common. Yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, like we don't have much budget for that. Yeah. So you pretty much have to go to Canada Council. Yeah. Right. But again, yeah. in, in a case like that, it's, it's actually you're paying the artist a, a commission or a fee to create the work. Whereas, um, you know, for Factor, for example, you can get money that will go towards marketing. You can get money that, you know, uh, go towards recordings, that sort of thing. So it's a slightly different approach. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to go to... Yeah, you'd have to go to get a subsistence grant from Canada yeah. Council, yeah. basically, yes. to, like, you know... There are, and they... It used to be more of a thing. I mean, I think it still exists, but it's just a little bit depleted from what it was 25, 30 years ago. Um, uh, you can still get tour support fairly easy, like in, for musicians uh, from Canada Council. Um, that's one that's pretty readily available. 
so I guess in answer to your question, um, yes, there's still investment being made, uh, but it's more direct investment uh, in terms of the grant programs for artists. And uh, all, uh, you know, the arts grants through innovation and and through this town is small. Like those are that's substantial. To see. we've seen a lot of work made in the last 18 months because of those programs, and I think that's that's really substantial. Yeah, I think like we can feel the rumblings of the cultural action plan or the cultural action plan from Innovation PEI. Like you can feel it. There's been investment that's happened. You can feel the rumblings. You can feel the ripple effect. But still, artists like we say, like we say, like I'm sure that both organizations here uh, have jury processes, right? So you still have to get through a jury as an artist to get the grant, right? It's competitive. It's competitive. People don't think of it always as a competitive industry, but it's super competitive. Um, so maybe we can just talk a little about what programs are provided by your uh, departments. And then, Pan, when we get to you, we could talk maybe a little bit about what it's like to sit on a jury at various levels. Because from what I'm hearing is that artists are being funded directly nationally, right? And, and through organizations and directly provincially. But there seems to be a bit of a then there's that weird jury that fits in there, and how does that work? There are also prizes, oh, and which prizes. I don't really know how that operates elsewhere, but it, it's becoming a bigger thing in the arts. I yeah. mean, actual cash coming from prizes that's like a difference maker level of cash. Yeah. Like 50000 so, or something. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, you, you were a Sobe Art Award finalist, Becca, and back then, what did you get, 2000 bucks? Yeah. yeah. Now, if, you're a, if you get in the top 25... I think it's significant. And if you make the top five, you, you make enough money for a year salary. Great. So they've, yeah, the Sobe, the so, <laughs> some of these, yeah. Can you do that again? <laughs> yeah, some of the, the Sobe family has put like a lot, and there are more and more of these popping up. So prizes are big, actually. Interesting. Can, yeah. So, I mean, Rob, you run, a, you run a prize, sort of like a, well, you run a, sh a, grant, a grant program. A grant program, yeah. but then you also have like an awards program. Too. Oh, yeah. So you could maybe talk a little bit about what your grant programs are and then maybe a little bit about the prizes. There's not money really attached to the prizes. No, program. the prizes are more for recognition yeah. and, you know, assist an artist in developing their profile and their career. Quite often, it's a great stepping stone to, you know, the next level, say the East Coast Music Awards and from there to the Junos. Um, which can make a huge difference in an artist's career. You do have the one award, though, that usually has a package. We do. It's the uh, New Artist of the Year, and yeah. it's a $1,000 bursary. Which is sweet. Yeah. yeah, especially for a young artist just starting out. But in terms of our, our grant program, um, we've structured it so there's three levels to it, and so there's an emerging, uh, an export development, and then the top one is the career investment. So we try and assist an artist through various stages of their career. Um, it is juried by a jury of uh, industry professionals. And uh, so the board or staff have nothing to do with making the decisions. The last few years, our success rate is about 50%. So half of the applicants that apply are getting funded, which is, you know, reasonably competitive. Um, I wouldn't want to see it go much lower than that um, because then there's a lot of disappointed people out there. But you look at some of the grant programs, Factor, for example, their juried sound recording. Results came out last night from Factor. Yeah. A lot of sad emails went around yesterday. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that, the success rate there is 5%, yeah. which is really, really low. So it's almost like winning the lottery, you know, getting uh, getting funding for a sound recording. So it, it, every organization is different. It depends on how much demand is on the, um, the program. And uh, yeah, the jury process, I think, is pretty, you know, it's a standardized type of system. Um, and Do you feel like it works for you? It's not perfect. It's an imperfect <laughs> system. And any time that you have individuals with their own, you know, sets of values, their understanding of the industry, different levels of understanding, it's always going to be slightly flawed. And uh, everybody has the things that they like and they don't like, and no matter how hard you try with the jury, sometimes you just can't get that bias out of the room. So, like, you could have somebody 
Well, I'll use the art, the PI Arts Grants as an example. So with that, we get applications from like all disciplines, all genres of music, like everything you can imagine. And then you have six people sitting around the table, and they all represent different parts of the of industries and stuff. But also, people seem to have more feelings about music than anything else. And um, if you get somebody that's like, I really don't like country, and next thing you know, those poor country artists are getting you know, scored kind of harshly. Or they get harsh comments, but then the scores are good. And like, anyway, you see that sort of thing all the time. And no matter what with juries, if people, they have, they have a hard time getting their personal tastes and feelings out of it. And they're not just evaluating the project the as proposal. the project yeah. is. So that's always a challenge with the jury program, I find. And that's not just with ours, but it's with any jury I've ever yeah, for sure. like, experienced and, ever. And the federal juries, I've been yeah. on the same exact what's thing. What's the uh, yeah. success rate for uh, applications for oh, the pro Lord. provincial um, This last round, we had 63 applications, and we funded 14 pr projects. So whoever wants to do the math on that. <laughs> it's like a quarter? Yes. 20, 20, 25. Yeah. So, uh, Shannon, can you just say, like, talk a little bit about what program, like, what granting uh, streams you provide sure. for innovation? Um, well, we have the PI Arts Grants, which is the one that artists would be most familiar with because they can apply twice a year directly to us, and it's the only. That is the only thing that we do where we work directly with the artists. The rest of the funding that we do through Innovation PEI, for the most part, is working with our partners who are sitting across the table from me here. And actually, you're all sitting across the table from me right now. Um, but that's where we spend a lot of our investment is going into actual industry associations. And then the industry associations work directly with the artists. But with the PI Arts Grants, we, work, we get to work directly with the artists there. But it's still a juried process. So it's the same thing. We don't make any decisions on who's getting funded there. We sit in a room and try and bite our tongue as much as possible and let the jury Which is really fight it hard. out. It's so hard because sometimes you know conversations can go in a direction where maybe they you know you need to bring them back and stuff, and you can't you can't as a person who's running a jury and you guys can all talk about this, but like no matter what with those juries, you yourself have to make sure that you aren't interjecting too much into it because you are not part of that decision-making process. You can't influence what is happening in that room. Otherwise, it's not really a juried process. It's a guided process at best. I don't even know how to put it. But anyway, other than that, though, we do have a couple of things that they'll do through Innovation PEI. Like, there's um, some marketing assistance programs that have been beneficial for, say, filmmaker, filmmakers who are traveling to different film festivals and stuff to promote their films. Um, we have partnered with, uh, with Film PEI, who have partnered on a larger Atlantic project that they're using that quite a bit. So when filmmakers are going to different key conferences and events, they can come to uh, Innovation PEI and apply for, I think it's 40%. Um, so that's, and that's really, all we have. And then there's like the things like Innovation PI does website assistance. If you don't have a website, you can apply for website assistance and it's a $500 grant. Um, it is not so helpful if you already have a website. <laughs> but if you don't have one, <laughs> yeah. Bob's your uncle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are kind of our key our key things that we fund. Cool, and I just want to mention, just because I've benefited from this, but this is because I'm a, like I've incorporated myself, so I'm a company, so I can engage with Innovation PI a little bit differently, and I can engage with their like professional services and professional development uh, funds differently. So like outside of the grant program, even in Innovation PI, if you're a business, I mean, I'm an artist, and that's a business. I don't know if that's an oxymoron. If, I don't know. Yeah, but if you're incorporated as then, a business. Then, like, you know, like, getting professional development is much easier, right? Like, learning leadership skills, learning, uh, you know, whatever, from conflict resolution to, you know. There's, there's quite a bit that can get funded through innovation if you are a business, if you're incorporated. But the, I should point out, though, that is not through the Cultural Development Division. Yeah. That is through other business development officers within the building. Good I can introduce you to them, Great. but I am not them. <laughs> my person. Renee, yeah. what are your, what are your uh, granting programs? Yes. They may not all continue. I don't know. Maybe they all will, because you're in the midst of year one, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, we just wrapped year one, okay, and I think it was one. very successful. Good. Very successful. Can't say anything on the air. But um, yeah, so we have, uh, last year was our first year for actually giving out substantial grants. 
uh, through the Film Forward program. So we were able to uh, give four short films uh, funding, um, and the 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 uh, program was actually about training and creating calling cards for for filmmakers so that they could kind of make their mark in the, in the film festival circuit and in the industry in general. Um, we also try, we also have a have really wanted to focus on one emerging slot per year for that program to make sure that we're uh, uh, b building you know the talent here. Um, I don't know if you'd like to me to, to talk about the other funding that people can get for film. Um, so that's that's local and, and that uh, fund comes from that's film forward is. Uh, funded from uh, innovation, and we and Fil Film PI administrates that. Um, so that's provincial. But we also oh oh also uh, Screenwriters Bootcamp is uh, funded by um, innovation, and there is a fifteen thousand dollar award for uh, proof of concept in uh, in that program as well. Uh, yeah, it's substantial. Yeah. So, um, but I have to say, like over the last couple of years, working with the federal government has been really interesting because there's been a lot of activity for um, the arts and film in particular. So, uh, one thing I wanted to say is that Canada Council's opened its doors to emerging artists, which is a huge deal, right? So, um, I, it's it w it just happened. So I don't know how that's a rippling down, but I hope, I hope it, it uh, works well. Because for, especially for rural areas where you don't have access to galleries that you show in so that you can get uh, onto the portal is, uh, of Canada Council, is, it's so much better for rural areas. Um, then there's places like um, Telefilm, they have the Talent to Watch program which is a $120,000 grant to do a feature film, your, fe your first feature film, or, uh, which can be a narrative or a documentary, and, uh, or you can do a web series. C can I ask yes. you, what percentage do they fund? Like that 100, Tell them, 100, 100%, could be 100%. 100%. Wow. You can, they, they've, capped, they've capped it at 250000 so they don't want you to go out and get like all this other money. It's meant like to be a million dollar project. Yeah, no, then, yeah. they don't want people to be leveraging it that way at this point. Um, there's the National Film Board has a program called the Filmmakers Assistance Program, and that's for emerging filmmakers to rent equipment and and that sort of thing for production and post production. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's a little bit to get you through, get your project finished, or you know, get it made. And um, and then for there's a lot of training opportunities across uh, Canada right now, which I think is it's way like I mean it, it's worth money to go to the National Screen Institute. You know, you get flown out there and you're trained. You get to meet. You know, Screenwriters Bootcamp is free. You get to do get all this training for free. Like like these are really important opportunities for artists to uh, to um, get their skill set up and meet the people they need to meet in order to get their careers uh, moving forward. So that's us for. Cool. <laughs> Pan, I'm just wondering, like, as someone who's been on many juries. Can you maybe you can like fun it up or something and give us like your like top five fun it, up, yeah. fun it up. Give us your like top five most awesome things to do when applying to a jury and then your well maybe start with your top worst. Your five top worst and your top top best. I want in on this. <laughs> <laughs> oh well um, Well, okay, first of all there's different kinds of juries, so um, one jury I'm always on is Art in the Open's jury. And really, it's a jury for projects that it's not, you're not going to live off it. You're just trying to execute the project. Um, so uh, that means that people, we get a lot of very sloppy applications. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> not just you. <laughs> yeah, so really, I mean, I would say the first thing is um, read the application. Because... Uh, you know, I would say, like, that's kind of scary to say, but I would say close to 50% of our Art in the Open applications this year actually 
didn't complete what was asked for in the application. That's kind of a problem. So just read the application um, and actually provide what's asked for. And the second thing I would say is it's kind of obvious and it sounds obnoxious, but it's actually it's the most important thing, which is do good work. And the reason I say that is because I think sometimes people will actually focus more, will actually stress themselves out beyond belief on all of the kind of career-oriented stuff related to trying to get funding, and then really not actually develop their work. So we received some applications this year where like literally the same project we received an application for the year before. And they're, the person's ideas hadn't advanced even an iota, but they were refining their technique of writing a grant. So what I would say is, if you're an artist who struggles with grant writing, don't hesitate to hire someone else to do it for you or to sit down and actually talk it through with you instead of trying to do it by yourself if it's not something you're particularly good at. And that seems obvious, but like really the most important thing is that your work is good. So have somebody else write it if you can't. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and there are a lot of grant writers There's a lot there. of people. I mean, I used to do it. I used to take a 5% cut for... Any, and I don't even know if you're supposed to do that, but anyway, <laughs> but I, but I mean, honestly, it was it was labor. It was my labor, and I I wanted to be paid for it, and I did it on spec, and I received money. Uh, you know, it's a little tiny bit of money. If it was successful. And you, if it was successful, and and you know, I got a few people grants, and that's I know a lot of people that do that. It's there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, somebody's got to do it, right? Um, the other thing I would say, I think the most important thing in any grant application uh, is. In, in the arts, in visual art anyway, uh, I, I'd say that's true of all the arts, is your supporting material. So, like, make sure your images are good, are dominant. That's really what matters. Honestly, we have so little time. I, the Canada Council jury is on this year. I had, I was recommended by the officer to spend a minimum of 10 minutes, please spend at least 10 minutes on each application. That's the situation we're in right now, where you're receiving 150 applications, and you've got a week to, to look through 150 applications, and you have a job already. So what is the actual amount of time people can spend on these things? You really need to like think about that for a second. If your application doesn't get to the point and doesn't have good images, you're fucked. I mean, that's, that's a reality. You, you have to have good images. What you write is second. It's not as important, honestly, in an art jury. It just isn't. And then in terms of what you write, write something simple, be clear, don't bullshit, Descri describe exactly what you're going to do. Uh, if, if, you, if you spend the first two paragraphs talking about the philosophy behind what you're doing, nobody cares. It's, 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 that sounds like you're obfuscating. You actually just need to describe what it is you're doing. That's what it matters the most. So simplicity, um, hire someone else to do it if, it if it's too hellish. And good supporting material, that's what I would say. Yeah, supporting material is so oh, man. Man. <laughs> I would say another thing, is, which is that Canada Council, it realistically, realistically, if you're going to be a visual artist, I, can, I can't speak to the other disciplines because they have a bit more commercial potential <laughs> than visual art. Uh, if you really want to be an artist and you're serious about it, you need to tap into Canada Council. You simply cannot make an artist, artistic career on provincial arts grants or uh, sales unless you want to totally sell out and do pictures of fishing boats. So you have to tap into Canada Council. You have to learn how to do that. And Canada Council gives roughly 30% rate, I would say. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say they toss about 30 to 40% of them right away. But I would oh, say right. that right yeah. now, at this moment with Canada Council, there is a real appetite for projects from the East Coast. Yes, oh, yes. for sure. There yeah. is an interest in, in the East Coast that I've never seen before. Like this jury, it was like they were, I was the East Coast person on the jury, and they were like, oh, I really love this project from New Brunswick. And, and I was like, that's a terrible project. But, but, <laughs> yeah. but because it was from Atlanta, Canada, there was a real yeah. interest in supporting Atlanta Canadian stuff. And like, I'm from here, so I'm kind of critical and like, yeah. But there, I really felt like there's a chance right now, so you should be trying to do it. But you should, don't go into it blindly, like, get somebody to help you. This town is small, 
Uh, the, I, I help a lot of people I, around I here. I film PE, I you will know? help as well. Yeah. Get someone to read your application. I just want to add to that about the, um, your, I just forgot my word, the supporting material. Like, it's shocking to me when, say, a musician is putting in a PI arts grant and they don't actually include any music. Yes, it's the same with film. Oh, and, and I say, and we, yeah. all, we have also seen that with filmmakers where they <laughs> haven't included anything. I'm like, you can only glean so much from a script when you're a filmmaker and you're somebody who, do you know what I mean? Like, you're asking an awful lot of a jury to review a few pitch, you know, script pages to actually be able to be like, yes, for sure, that should get funding to do whatever. Like, you need to be, you need to give these jurors actual things to review, whether it is, you know, images or music to actually listen to. And, like, sure, if it's a recording project and you haven't recorded yet because you can't be applying for funding if you know, already, but you can at least give samples of what you used to do, you know, what you did previously, or you or can demos. give them demos. Like, your iPhone is a wonderful thing for that, you know what I mean? Like, there's no excuse not to include that sort of support material. And I would also throw in there, um, depending on who you are applying to, like what kind of funding organization it is, there's a real difference in the language sesh that you're using, right? Like when you're applying for an arts grant or a can to cancel grant, you're speaking a different language sort of than if you were applying to Music PEI or Factor. Music PEI and Factor, they're very interested in return on investment. It's a business investment and it's a different kind of language and it's different kind of stuff that you need to be talking about for them because they want to know how this is, you know, building your career and moving you forward in that way. With our PI arts grants with, you know, Can to Cancel the Arts, they want to know how it's moving your artistic practice forward. They want to know that you are going to actually be developing as an artist and moving, you know, forward in a different way and creating and, like, just... It's, it's a very different thing. And so, like, you know, we saw a few with the PI arts grants this time around, like, that were very clearly factor applications that have been, re like, not even repurposed. Like, they were basically exactly the same application that came in. And so, like... The words were all wrong. Like it wasn't the kind of stuff that the jury wanted to hear about because they don't want to hear about how you're going to sell, you know, 1,500 copies of this new record or you're going to do whatever. Like the jury wants to know why you are creating and why you are, you know, making this particular art form at this particular time. So I think it's really important for artists to understand that. And I probably have more conversations with musicians than anybody else leading into the arts grants deadlines because Music PI has done such a good job of training everybody how to write for their granting program that they have a really hard time wrapping their brain around writing for the more artistically focused things. That's a super important point and it kind of builds on what you were saying too, Pan, is you know read the application, but also do your research about the organization that you're applying to. You need to know you know, how to frame that, that application. And it's generally not in the literature on the website. You know, it's not something that they're, they're not going to tell you. We don't want to hear about the business. We want to hear about the art. Yeah. That just Call is not there. Call your funding officer. Yeah, like that's, that's why we're all here. Call Especially, your officers. Every organ. Canada, Canada Council funding. They're, uh, they're great. great to talk to you, which are... You should know the rhetoric, right? Each on occasion, they have different rhetoric. I've had some funding officers that are zero help, and in fact, are more of a hindrance than a help. But for the most part, they are—they're there to help you, and and they. They want to see you succeed. They know that only a percentage of you are going to succeed, but they want to genuinely want to see you succeed. And I think also, you know, you mentioned about um, missing information. A lot of it depends on the application form. We have a form that you can't submit unless everything is filled out. And you know, if attachments are required that, that it's attached, it won't let you submit. And there are a lot of forms out there that aren't like that. Um, I know Factor is. You can't <laughs> Factor. It's it's you got to have every dot in there, or you can't put it in. So a lot of it depends on who you're applying to. Um, but uh, you know, we see it, it's interesting because we've seen a huge development in the quality of our funding applications from when we started, 2008, uh, our first year. The funding applications were 
a lot of them were just terrible. Well, it was such a learning curve too, being the first year. Like it yeah. was legitimately a brand new thing. It was brand new for you guys. It was brand new for the artists. So like that was a huge learning moment for everybody. We don't we don't have in this pro province very many um, sort of de very much daily access to certain kinds of I would say uh, discourse around certain arts. So. Um, I think music has, mu the music industry is a little bit different because it's a very, I think we have a lot of experience in PEI, a lot of people have a lot of experience in the music industry, but uh, because it is, a, because it does have a kind of grassroots commercial existence, like people can play for money on a regular basis, so there's a certain understanding. There's a critical mass. There's a critical mass, there's an understanding, we know what I think in popular culture we know more about how the music industry might work. But I think that something like visual art is a, is a difficult one because um, unless you're actively seeking out those the, the kind of texts that make up the art world, like every 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 art world, every world of this has its own language, and um, it's. I, 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 take, I think of the example of I was receiving student papers this year and I had one student who didn't like their grade and said, you know, I did everything you asked for, you know, what's wrong with this paper? And they said, well, you know, like if you actually looked at an essay on this top, on, in this field, on this topic, you would recognize immediately that your paper is really, really you know, doesn't read very well, you haven't read very, like, if you, ha if you want to, you know, act be active in, in the art world, which is a thing that exists, and, and then you should know something about it. You should learn something about it and not be uh, kind of going in clueless. And I, I don't think it's that complicated either. It's no more complicated than any other field. But people seem to, we have a really strong mythology around being a little bit brainless in the arts and like, oh, it's all just a kind of, uh, you know, random inspiration or something. <laughs> but the, it's, it's like anything else and you just, you learn how to do it and you, and you learn the, the terminology. It's not that complicated, the terminology, no more complicated than any other field. I mean. It's just hard when you're not, I, I had this conversation with Canada Council for three years where I've been trying to get them to have two different kinds of juries a rural jury and an urban art center jury because they think that having somebody from Halifax on a jury for uh, contemporary art uh, that a PEIer is applying for is, is actually our peer and I don't think that's the case. I think that because we don't have a central, uh, um, like we don't have a school, but it's always a school, right? So I feel like you don't have the people coming out of it, you don't have those, you know, you don't have that programming. A school really creates an urban art center, I think. Anyway, so what I feel like... But that's a, that's a, that's a problem with any small town or any that's rural right. area. So rural, I think that there's like a... So then you're, the rural, people living in rural areas have to do that but, work instead of being but I But I think that I, I wouldn't underestimate there, the advantages that you out, have right? coming from so I think that's a, one of the a things rural that area and actually I, and a little a bit of ignorance can be to your but advantage. But I, but I so <laughs> I'm not say, suggesting that everybody needs to become an expert on the visual arts, no, no. but I do think that um, that there is a kind of willful blindness that we like encourage here sometimes or, or, or accept, but I also think you can have a real advantage coming from here uh, in that you're you know, if you grow up in Manhattan, like, look at where the, the really strong artists co have come from in the last hundred years. They don't come from Manhattan. They don't come from, you know, like, they don't tend to come from the center. They come from some, from Idaho and go there. And the thing is, is that if you grow up in a place like that, you actually have a certain disadvantage because you're like, you're actually t overwhelmed with... Right. The, all of that stuff, and you actually, it becomes difficult to, to, to stand on your own feet. But if you come from PEI, you can actually have a unique vision very, a lot more easily in a way. So there's kind of a give and take there, and I think that I saw that the last jury I was on, that there was, yes, okay, there was some 
you know, maybe there was, is a little less sophisticated in some ways, less access to whatever. But there was the, the applications coming from more uh, remoter areas were actually really interesting. And kind of people were, were kind of pleasantly surprised, whereas the, the ones that were coming from the centers just was like, oh, you went through an MFA program, you're saying the same thing that everybody else is saying. So, I, you know, it's a kind a of a... A little too homogenous? Like yeah, a little too homogenous, yeah. So you're so, A little too homogenous, I so, guess. A little too homogenous, yeah. So you're so. saying that the people were like being being more open to artists who may not have had the language but have like that spark that you were talking about, right? Like that uh, there's something there kind of something thing. Something fresh, something yeah. interesting. Uh, That's something good. with urgency <laughs> maybe, like a real sometimes when you come if you grow up in uh, like I grew up in Charlottetown. Like I wanted to be in the arts because I wanted desperately to be in the arts. I had urgency, it mattered. It was like, I felt like a need to do that. And sometimes people are in a situation where it's like a small town or whatever. You, what do you, look, Andy Warhol, he, you know, there's a song about him growing up in a small town. Like he wanted to get the hell out of Pittsburgh. That's what it was all about. And sometimes that's a, a driving force, you know, to make for urgent art. Um, I just wanted to make a point about uh, jury makeup, and I think all of us try and do the same thing, and that is make our jury as diverse as possible. I think most funders try and, and achieve that, so we're looking at you know age, gender, genre, uh, location on the island. We always try and, and bring in a couple of rural people as well as urban. Um, so diversity is super important because you're gonna get applications from a diverse group. So, uh, you know, you can actually have champions, I guess, is, is the point. Um, but it, it really helps to make for a much more fair jury. Yeah, we use Off-Island. Do you? Yeah, but that makes more really? sense for you guys, yeah. though. The film community is so, so tiny small. right now. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't think you could have a fair yeah. jury if you were jurying amongst yourselves we're at actually, this point. And you, when you started off, you used to bring in off-island people, did. too. Yeah, we're pretty fortunate now because we've got enough professionals on the island yeah. that, um, and awesome. ones that don't apply for funding every round. Yeah, so exactly. yeah. yeah, that's good. Once you get... You can see, like, Music PI is a good success story because you can see the resonance, uh, the resonance of the investment, all like right. working. Yeah. Right. There's been a, quite a bit of investment in small town. There's been quite a, an investment in film PI. I don't know about Writer Skilled, uh, some of the other organizations. I'm not sure. So I'm excited to see where the ripple effect will They're, go. It's starting. And I feel like I want to end the panel part just by asking, like, why? Like, why do you fund artists, or why do you want to fund artists? Pan already mentioned something about, like, I don't know, because, you know, art, you're driven to art, or, you know, there's some sort of, like, need to have a cathartic release or something. That's not quite, not quite, not quite right. I know, I know. I'm butchering <laughs> your words, but... So, like, what, why? Why do you fund artists? We'll start with Rob. I don't think you can emphasize enough how important arts and culture is to building a healthy community. I mean, it's just, it, it is super critical. And when that investment's not made, you see communities fall apart. You see, you know, communities disappear uh, when that, that, that cultural center of, of the community is not there. So... Um, fortunately, you know, like I, I started right off the top saying, we're really fortunate in Canada that we get it here. Um, there's so many places that don't. Uh, you look at a lot of the Scandinavian and Nord Nordic countries, they have very similar kind of support that we do. Um, the UK, which is interesting, you would think that there is really strong support there. It's not great. It's, it's certainly better than the US. But um, no, we're just, we're really lucky and I, you have to do it. Definitely depends on the governments in the UK, depending on the government, yes. it goes up and down. From, for film, um, film's really interesting because we watch. So it, like, it's, become, it's become a record of our history, right? So, and I went to this amazing, talk by the Gina Davis Institute talking about 
women's representation on film and how it directly affected how many women were in government, how many women were in... And so I think that, the pa like, per me personally, I love the idea of film being our history and, like, making sure that we're engaging people of color and women and LGBTQ community, like, all these people so that they can make a mark in our history books, right? That's why, that's, that's my driving force and why I spend a lot of time developing, like, anybody who walks through our door. That would be such an interesting talk to hear, to see, like, how many women are in film influencing how many women are in government or, like... It was directly... Rep it w they had, like, 17% on TV equals 17% in the Senate or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, like, crazy. And in the UK, where it was much higher, you saw a much higher uh, uh, number of women in government. It was really interesting. I mean, it makes sense, because we are, like, creating representations of life, right? Which then get... I w I'll say marketed just because I can't think of any other word right now, thanks to Art in the Open, but... Uh, yeah, like, there's a... There's a something about... ideas moving, or... Anyway, I'm going to go to Shannon. Why did... Why? Why well, Thunder Artist? Why just Thunder Artist? going to piggyback on what Renee was saying, because it is, it's... I can see how that's, that study was a real thing because honestly, it's through stuff like that. Like that's how you get inspired to do the things, right? Like that's it's that saying you hear it over and over again: you cannot be what you can't see. So if you don't see women on screen doing certain roles, then of course you're not going to have some little girl somewhere in the middle of nowhere get inspired to maybe do that role because she doesn't know that that's an option. Same thing with people of color, LGBTQ, everything. Like so, the more you can get all these different and unique voices out there in whatever way possible, the better it is. And honestly, I don't know what we would do if we didn't have art and culture. Like, I don't know why we'd be doing any of the things that we do. And like, I'm saying this not so much as a government person, but as me as a human, like, I can't imagine living in a world where we're not surrounded by art and creation. Like, I don't know why I would want to have a day-to-day -day anything if I didn't have that in my life. That's why you support art, because it feeds us, it fuels us, it makes you want to, you know, carry forth. <laughs> Pan, your original uh, point that you were making about how the arts are, and artists are exploited, uh, and that ex exploitation of... Uh, I, that's another really good reason why we need to support and fund the arts, because it is exploited so much, and people are expected to do stuff for free all the time. So it's for exposure, yeah. she says with air quotes. But <laughs> you take that, you take that support and that funding away, <laughs> you're not left with a pretty picture. No, you're really not. I mean, I, I think I think art will happen whether it's funded or not. Par Paris is burning will happen with no money. Milton Acorn will be out there stumbling around with no money, and people will be spitting on him and so forth. But it, so I don't really know that funding makes better art or anything like that, or, or or helps encourage the arts even. Like I actually don't. But I think it's less cruel, uh, a more it's a better it's a better society to live in. I mean. I think paying people for their work, you know, I, I don't, I, I have no idea if like what, what the result, I mean, the United States produces lots of good culture and it's cruel, it's a cruel place. I mean, it's, it's a totally in, unequal society, it's exploitative in the extreme and yet much, most, most of my favorite, a lot of my favorite cultures come, comes out of there all the time. But I don't, I, I, I think it's a moral question about, you know, paying people for their work and having a, a better society. I don't know that Norway produces that much good art, but it's a, I think it's a better place to live for people, so. I think that's the bottom Apparently line. Apparently people are happier there. But. Yeah, I think, I think that's the bottom line. It's about being, uh, you know, being a better society. I, I, don't, I don't know, yeah. I mean, and obviously I'm a fan of culture, but I, th I think you can, you can be like frustrated in 1980s PEI and like, have a punk band and make no money, and that's just as valid as a, uh, or it's just as likely to happen and be, be make good art as funded art, but it's just a, a worse. It's almost yeah. like, it's like a built-in class system or something. Yeah. In a way. 
I like to think of art art as the lower leisure class. The lower leisure class? Yeah. Great. I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a t-shirt that says that. I'm part of the lower leisure class. And on the back we'll just say artist. We could be my team jersey. Thank you everybody for coming. I think that was a good way to end uh, the talk. Thank you, Pan, Shannon, Renee, and Rob for talking about funding and what it's like and why we do it and how we do it here on PI. And just a reminder that you can witness, listen to uh, the podcasts every Thursday probably coming out um, for the next nine weeks. They're very diverse. They're around 45 minutes each. So it's not a super long listen, but they're really fun. This town of small.com under projects and you'll see small town podcasts.